can I just check that you can hear me okay? Uh, I'm afraid I've got a little bit of a sore throat from singing last night, uh, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, first by thanking the BES for giving me the opportunity to give this lecture, and I'd especially like to thank them for the opportunity of hearing Bill Sutherland recite to a haggis last night. It was magnificent. Um, so obviously I'm going to give a, a bit of a romp through various things that have, I found interesting uh, this year. There have been lots of things going on this year. It's been the year of soils. It's also been the year of field work, apparently. And of course, it's been a, a year of mass human migrations. And I, I'm not going to talk about any of that. Um, what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to focus on some issues related to biodiversity. I think variation in natural systems is really important and ecologists are interested in the origin, the maintenance of variation, the consequences of its loss. And I think this interest in variation diversity is what marks ecologists out as being different from other kinds of biologists who find variation uh, a bit of a nuisance. So I'm going to talk about some new science related to that uh, in, well, it's, it's not, the title I was given was 12 months in ecology, so I stretched it back to December 2014. Uh, I'm going to talk about some conservation issues, and then uh, I'm going to say a little bit about some policies and politics, uh, which at the moment uh, are, of course, extremely interesting. Uh, I wanted just to begin by saying something about biodiversity and its importance in lots of different contexts. And here's one example that I found particularly interesting. It's related to aspects of my own work. Um, there's something called Pito's paradox, uh, which is all animals, they begin life from a single cell. Large animals have to divide their cells a lot more uh, in order to reach their large size. Dividing cells can cause problems. Cells can accumulate mutation. So it's expected that large animals, lots more cell division, will have a higher cancer risk than smaller animals. The paradox, Pito's paradox as it's called, is that they don't. So elephants, for example, are relatively cancer resistant, despite the massive amount of cell division that they undertake. Now, an interesting paper that came out uh, this year, this paper here, shows that Elephants have 10 times as many copies uh, as humans do of a key gene, P53, which is involved in uh, DNA damage checkpoints and, and arresting the problems uh, that you get when cells are damaged. And I, I think that's really interesting. Uh, and I think the fact that cancer biologists are looking at elephants is pretty amazing. And comparative biology and the clever tricks that animals have evolved in order to get round problems uh, are extremely interesting and relevant in lots of different contexts. Now, moving on to more ecological things, uh, understanding biodiversity and ecosystem stability is, of course, really important. And new species continue to be identified. Uh, I, I, sorry, I flipped through that a little quickly, but there are lots of examples uh, of new species found in the past year on that slide. New habitats also. Uh, here's an example of a new habitat. For those of you who are geographically challenged, this is Scotland here. This is the uh, Outer Hebrides. And at, right out here, a couple of hundred kilometers off the Scottish coast, there's a very interesting deep sea area, the Hatton Rockall Basin. And it was suspected that there was an interesting biological area on the seabed down there, more than a kilometer down uh, in this area here, the Hatton Rockall Basin. Um, and an expedition that went out to have a more serious look in July 2015 found that there was indeed a cold seep on the floor. This is a TV picture on the floor, and you can see that here there's something seeping up uh, through the ocean bed. It's cold water. It creates a very unique ecosystem uh, on the seafloor, and that involved a collaboration uh, between lots of different organizations. There's lots of unique species down there, and quite close by, there's another area uh, of deep water 
uh, spongy. So new habitats being found. So at the moment, of course, we have a relatively poor idea of the number of species on Earth. Um, it's been estimated that there are, uh, so far, about one and a half million valid species have been described. And as you know, uh, quite a lot of them are beetles. There's an astonishing uh, diversity of beetles. And this paper here I find very interesting, which came out uh, looking at, OK, we don't know how many beetles there are, but they developed some new approaches uh, to estimating beetle numbers. They came up with four new estimates of the number of beetle species. The average was one and a half million species of beetles alone, so as much as we previously had estimated as species on Earth. And the authors of that paper said that the range was surprisingly narrow in their estimates, 0.9 to 2.1 million. That seemed to me a huge range. <laughs> uh, but just illustrating our lack of confidence uh, in species number. Also, our estimates of abundance uh, of organisms is also uh, not as good as we might think. Trees are, uh, of course, conspicuous kinds of organisms. And this paper here, uh, again, 2015 in Nature, uh, mapping tree density on a global scale, has shown us that there are many more trees uh, than we previously thought. We, trees have been estimated as being around about 400 billion. And the most recent estimate is now that there's over three trillion trees on Earth. So there's a lot we still have to learn, both about the number of species uh, and their abundance. Obviously, species diversity, as well as abundance, uh, is very important. It's important to understanding ecosystem stability. It's important in setting conservation priorities. And a paper, a fairly recent paper, although this is the one I stretched back to December 2014, has, has emphasized again that trophic coherence is really important uh, to ecosystem stability. Trophic coherence is how structured the ecosystem is. So this is a highly coherent ecosystem here, and this is not a very coherent ecosystem. Uh, and the more species you have at the same trophic level, uh, and the more structuring then of the ecosystem, these authors show that the more stability that confers to an ecosystem. So more species doing the same kind of thing is important to ecosystem stability. Now that relates to uh, a puzzle because one thing that, that biologists often ask is how can so many similar species coexist? Uh, so back to beetles uh, again, uh, this paper here uh, is looking at diving beetles and there's over 4,000 species of diving beetles and what the authors of this paper show, uh, or suggest really, but they, they provide some evidence, is that evolution can drive species into groups of lookalikes that are functionally similar. So that's quite important, but it also suggests that some species may be functionally irrelevant, and uh, they refer to it as evolution of functional redundancy. So does that mean that we don't need to worry about biodiversity? There's lots of functionally redundant species in ecosystems. And can we lose some of these functionally redundant species without affecting ecosystem function? Well, as I mentioned already, this trophic coherence and the number of species doing similar things in an ecosystem may be very important to ecosystem stability. This kind of replication of roles uh, may be giving ecosystems more resilience. And it, but importantly, it, it also appears that this functional redundancy doesn't apply so much the higher up trophic levels you go and, and also to larger bodied species, and that's also uh, important. An experimental paper that came out this year shows that species that are functionally redundant in one set of conditions, when the environment changes, can suddenly become pivotal. And that's this species here, this uh, paper here, rather, that was in PNAS, that functional redundancy changes 
as environmental conditions change. Now, of course, we're faced with uh, a lot of environmental change at the moment, and more functionally similar species may improve ecosystem resilience. So we can't assume that we can lose species, however irrelevant they may seem, that we can lose these species and that it doesn't impact on the stability of the ecosystems to which they belong. Now, I now move, want to move on a little bit more <coughs> to biodiversity conservation. Of course, there are many species at risk of extinction, and it's rather a gloomy time uh, at the moment. It, and it also used to be said or thought that, the, that there was no difference, uh, that there was a difference between marine and terrestrial habitats, that things were a bit better in the marine systems. We now know that that's not true. There's no difference between marine and non-marine habitats. There's problems in all. And that for the best studied species, uh, about 20 to 25 percent are threatened with extinction. So these two papers here, in that context, recent papers are, 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 I found very interesting. Uh, the suggestion rather dramatically that the Earth is on the brink of a sixth mass extinction event, that the exceptionally rapid loss of biodiversity that we've been seeing over the last few centuries uh, is, is unprecedented, perhaps, and that we have to face up to the fact that much of that uh, may be due to anthropogenically induced change. Uh, and this paper here uh, in Science, Humans as Super Predators, shows that we are a big part of the problem. The way we predate species, exploit them, and remove adults from healthy adults from the population has devastating consequences for the demography of those populations and for their futures. So we need to think hard uh, about how uh, human harvesting or damaging animal populations needs to change. Uh, the WWF report, uh, The Living Blue Planet, always very interesting. The 2015 one gives data for over 1,200 species of marine organisms tracked over the past 45 years, almost 6,000 populations, and they report on average a decline of 49% in the size of marine populations and attribute this to human population uh, and climate change. Human exploitation, rather, not by population as well. Uh, here's an example from the, the United Kingdom, the nice publication that comes out on the state of the United Kingdom birds. It's a partnership uh, of lots of different organizations. It involves a lot of citizen science, which is a wonderful feature uh, of, of United Kingdom species tracking in particular. However, as you can see, this is for different groups of birds, farmland birds here, woodland birds in green, marine birds in blue, and a whole lot uh, in black. Uh, especially the farmland birds are continuing uh, to decline, and many of these species uh, are red-listed species now, uh, and they are in trouble. An interesting paper that just came out a couple of weeks ago uh, look, had a look at um, the population status of different kinds of organisms. This is data from the United Kingdom over 40 years, looking at over almost 4,500 species, looking at the role of species in ecosystems and what's happening to their populations. The more red, uh, then the more highly significant declines. Pollinator species then are showing particularly worrying declines, as, as we know, uh, and also species which uh, are lumped as, as being culturally valuable, as I've said already, though that doesn't mean to say they don't have an important role in ecosystem stability. Um, but for animals only, there's big problems, less so uh, if you include the plants. But interestingly, uh, two groups in particular aren't showing massive declines, uh, species which are involved in decomposition uh, and species involved in carbon sequestration. So I think it's interesting to see that uh, it's not uniform across ecosystems. Organisms with different roles are declining at different rates. Whether that's encouraging or depressing uh, depends on your perspective. Now, what can we do? Well, there are many things going on, and obviously I, I don't have time to go into them, 
Uh, one I think that, that is particularly interesting is the idea of trying to restore uh, species that are lost. There was a symposium uh, on this the other day here, uh, rewilding. Uh, reintroductions can work, but of course they're very controversial. Uh, we heard about the red kite and the, in Scotland the poisoning uh, that's preventing that population becoming as well established as it should have been. And of course people, the idea of in reintroducing wolves, for example, into Scotland uh, does not go down well. Uh, with the farming community. So th there are problems. That doesn't mean we shouldn't consider it. Uh, this is a very interesting paper uh, that came out in PNS, PNES this year, uh, pointing out that it's best to view reintroductions uh, in terms of trophic levels and that using larger bodied species from higher trophic levels uh, is better because there's less functional redundancy as I mentioned already from other papers, there's less functional redundancy in the species at higher trophic levels and in larger bodied species, and they can be more pivotal uh, in determining ecosystem stability. So this paper, which is reviewing that whole field, suggests that we can restore from the top down and that these top down trophic interactions are very important. That means that sometimes people criticize conservation organizations for saying, let's reintroduce tigers, let's reintroduce wolves. But these may be the very species that can have this top-down effect, but they also gain enormous public support. So uh, there will be scientific justification uh, for that approach. In Scotland, uh, we are waiting to see the outcome of uh, the government decision on beavers in Scotland. Uh, this was also... Uh, mentioned the other day, uh, Scott, the, there's been a reintroduction program in Scotland for the beaver. Here's a species, if ever there was an ecosystem engineer, this is one. Uh, and the Scottish National Heritage produced this report, which was published in June 2015, and it's with the Scottish Government to make a decision on the future of beavers in Scotland. The decision seems to have been delayed a bit, uh, maybe it's being delayed until after the Scottish elections. We'll see. So that brings me to politics. Uh, the political landscape is changing. It's changed a lot. Uh, so this is the distribution of political parties, the seats that they hold in 2010 across the UK Parliament, Conservative in blue, Labour in red, Liberal Democrat and Scottish Nationalists. So just keep an eye uh, on the yellow and red in particular. Here's the distribution in 2015, the Scotland uh, in the UK government has gone over to being almost entirely represented by the Scottish Nationalists and the Labour Party uh, has contracted and we now have a government, a Tory majority government and the Scottish Nationalists uh, hold great sway in Scotland both in the UK Parliament and in the Scottish Parliament. That means more confidence in the Scottish Government. They've been bringing forward their land reform bill this will have wide-ranging effects on land, manage, land management and community rights in Scotland. And it needs very careful monitoring to ensure uh, that conservation of land and ecosystems is part uh, of that land reform. But interestingly, the bill was rejected by the party at the SNP conference in October 2015 as being too timid. And the party has said that we expect amendments on this bill to give it some real teeth, to give more power to communities, and in particular uh, to tackle, to introduce measures to tackle tax haven ownership of land, which is a big issue in Scotland. Uh, another consequence of the uh, majority government, uh, the Tory government for the United Kingdom, is that we're going to have a referendum on uh, membership of the European Union. Now, the European Union at the moment has strong legislative framework for nature conservation. The birds' habitats, water quality directives are really important. They protect all wild birds. They require member states to designate special protection areas. They protect more than a thousand rare and endemic plant and animal species. It's very strong legislation, this. Uh, and the network, the Natura 2000 network, is protecting more than one million kilometers uh, of terrestrial and marine habitats across Europe. 
Now, these birds and habitat directives are undergoing a fitness check, and there's a talk about that just at 10 o'clock, I think it is, this morning. Um, and the instruction has been to merge or modernize. Modernize is very worrying. Um, there's been evidence gathering. The BES was part of that, and there was a submission in 2015 from over 100 UK non-governmental organizations. There's been a big campaign uh, across Europe, the Defend Nature campaign, which has had more than half a million supporters. And today, the European Union ministers are meeting in order to make decisions about the future of these directives. So looking ahead, this is going to be really important. Now, we have an in-out refer referendum on Europe uh, for the United Kingdom by 2017. Leaving the European Union can have potentially catastrophic effects for nature conservation if the legislation which we are now under uh, is repealed. And even if we were to remain in the European economic area, the water, habitats and birds directives do not apply to the countries uh, in, the, in the European economic area. They only apply to the member countries. So uh, we really have to watch what's happening there. There's also important EU legislation in the pipeline, for example, in relation to fishing in the deep sea. I mentioned these unique habitats. Uh, the European Union approved restrictions on deep sea trawling in 2013, but that is not yet in place. And there's no outright ban on trawling in the deep sea. And the reason for that was because it was considered that there was insufficient data. Uh, this paper, which came out in 2015, shows on this axis is the bycatch uh, in relation to the depths that you're fishing at. As you go deeper, you get a higher proportion of bycatch species, especially sharks and rays. Once you go below 600 meters, you start to get more bycatch than you are getting commercially uh, viable species. So this paper provides good evidence that we should not be trawling uh, at depths below 6,000 meters. Now, uh, can we rely on the United Kingdom government to give environmental protection a high priority uh, and to have the kind of evidence-based policy approach that you would like. Well, that sceptical impression is one that uh, I'm afraid I share. Um, I just wanted to give an example from Gulls because I've been involved with Gulls at different points in my career. Before the general election, there was a promise to do something, uh, not specified what, something about these murderous gulls that are terrorizing the nation. Uh, David Cameron promised a wonderful sum of 250,000 to fix this problem once and for all. Uh, of course, anyway, after there was a conservative majority, he scrapped that idea, uh, there won't be any money. But then this summer there was a dog killed uh, and a tortoise killed. I don't know how many children were killed by dogs, but uh, the fact that gulls killed a dog was considered outrageous and the poor tortoise was eaten alive. A concert pianist even, uh, he, sprained, <laughs> he sprained his finger uh, after a vicious seagull attack and had to cancel uh, a concert, and, and this created a national outrage. So David Cameron said, right, as he does, let's just have a big conversation, forget about any money. We'll have that in some pub or other. He hangs around with dubious characters in pubs, as you know. Um, the Telegraph, uh, in, they had a conversation with six, uh, I think they were Cornish MPs, it was reported in the Telegraph on the 17th of July, uh, and the one MP had suggested that gull eggs could be removed and swapped for moth eggs. <laughs> uh, so that's the standard of science we expect. I suspect he meant mock eggs and not moth eggs, but you can't, uh, you really can't be sure. Um, other examples, uh, badgers and tuberculosis in cattle, of course. Uh, the efficacy of culling is not supported by the 10-year, £50 million government-funded field trial, which concluded that culling badgers could make no meaningful contribution to B TB control in Britain. In some circumstances, culling badgers was shown uh, to make matters worse, and also that the, cut, the way the culling is being done is ineffective and inhumane. And what... Uh, has the government done? Uh, it reintroduced culling uh, and also then recently just extended the areas in which culling will take place, despite protests from very high level scientists uh, involved uh, in that area of research. 
bees and nicotinoid pest, nicotinoid pesticides. There's an EU moratorium on the use of these pesticides. I showed you earlier that pollinators are in trouble. Uh, and some studies, not all, have shown that these pesticides can harm bees. It was decided there should be a moratorium until we really understand what's happening. But following application by the UK National Farmers Union, these pesticides uh, are now allowed to be used for a four-month period in areas of England. The UK has lost its world climate leadership role by axing uh, the green policies. Uh, all the subsidies for green energy are being removed. Although, interestingly, I saw in The Guardian this morning that maybe, 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 maybe they're going to have a rethink on that after the outcome of the climate change conference, but we'll see. A couple of other points I just want to end on. Can we rely on the impartiality of our own research, of academic research? Uh, this is the strategy document for the Natural Environment Research Council. It's called the Business of the Environment. And one thing that it's really pushing researchers to do uh, is to form partnerships with industry, business, government, and so on, uh, particularly partnerships which will provide research funding. Now, of course, nothing wrong with that, uh, provided that the research is impartial with respect to uh, the interests of the funder. Now, can we rely on that impartiality? Well, there was an interesting article just the other week uh, in the Times Higher Education. Uh, is industry funding undermining trust in academic science? Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, and also, I think that it's been shown uh, that research funded by a, a vested interest group is four times more likely to come up with the answer uh, in favour of the group that's funding than research which is not funded. And the, the British Medi obviously there's a big issue in medicine. The British Medical Journal has, has been mounting a very robust campaign in order to try to, to get, ensure that data is deposited, it can't be treated as confidential. Uh, and it's not just medical research that this applies to. Uh, scientists from all disciplines are at risk. And we need to be very careful uh, about this kind of thing. The other thing I just wanted to mention was that while the ecosystem services approach to nature conservation has lots of good things about it, ways of selling uh, conservation to governments and so on, uh, it's the dangerous approach. Uh, it commodifies habitats and species. This is, there was a nice article in Tree earlier this year by Jonathan Silvertown pointing out aspects of this. Uh, but also... Um, this emphasis on services rather than the role of species is, is really a dangerous way to think about how ecosystems are structured. If we just think about organisms as providing a service that's beneficial to humans and not about their role in ecosystem and their importance in ecosystem stability, then that may be very damaging uh, for nature conservation. Um, for example, the bees have been calculated that the value of wild bee pollination uh, is several thousand dollars per hectare. Uh, that's this paper here. Um, and, uh, of course, they're really important. However, that paper also shows that of the 20,000 known bee species, only about 2% of those species pollinated 80% of the crops. Now, does that mean that we can forget, then, uh, about the other 98% of bee species that they're irrelevant, they don't provide a surface. Well, of course not, and part of the defense of that is this role of species in ecosystem stability, and, and the idea that they may not be important now doesn't mean to say that in the future, uh, should something happen to the key pollinators, that these species would not become really important, and that they're very important uh, for the stability of the ecosystem. So we've still got lots to do and learn there. I wanted to end on what I hope is a good news story, of course, the outcome uh, of the climate... Sorry, it's a bit fuzzy, this, but uh, the outcome of the climate change conference, uh, somewhat surprisingly, the aspiration is to try to limit the temperature rise to one and a half degrees. So let's hope that there is action on that in particular. 
So I'd just like to conclude then by saying there's lots that we still have to understand about biodiversity and ecosystem stability. And, and we need more research on that, but we also need to make sure that the science is understood by policymakers. Uh, the decisions they make, of course, are to some extent out of the hands of science, but we need to make sure that they understand what's happening. Uh, and also, we need to make sure that the public is well informed. The public voice is becoming increasingly important, and we need to make sure the public know really what's going on uh, and what the science tells us. I'd just like to end with some thanks to Paul Walton from the RSPB, Des Thompson from SNH, Francis Neat from Marine Scotland, who all provided me with some information, and to some of my own colleagues uh, and others in Glasgow who said to me, don't be too political. <laughs> so I tried to keep my politics a little bit under check. So thank you very much. <laughs>